adjustment that occurred in the 17th century when this system was disrupted. The Peripheral Revolution became a watering ground for economists trying to push their theories. Um, this is actually very interesting. A lot of very prominent theories that still remain relevant today came out of the analysis of the price revolution. I'm just going to go over a couple of them. I won't have time to do the analysis that I was planning on for it all. I'll try to just give you guys a minor idea of what I'm talking about in my essay. Um, one of them is the quantity theory of money, um, the Malthusian population theory, which no one really, I mean, historians kind of still believe in it, but no one else really believes in it at all. It's kind of, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, there are models that Adam Smith used in his Wealth of Nations that are tied from the Price Revolution. And um, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Earl Hamilton, but I know all of you guys have heard of John Maynard Keynes. And John Maynard Keynes tied a lot of his research from Earl Hamilton. So in order to understand the economic situation we have today, which is based primarily on John Maynard Keynes, it's essential to look at the theories that gave him his ideas, which is what I essentially do in this paper. If I could go back and write it again, I would cut out probably half of it and take the section about um, Hamilton and Keynes and make it twice as long, just because I, I did all this research and I started writing the paper and I didn't realize how much information I had. I don't know if we're making the paper all along or should have been, and I still didn't have the opportunity to describe my ideas in the way that I should have, but that's all hindsight's 2020. Um, my thesis is basically two parts. My first thesis is that money is essential to understanding the price revolution. My second thesis is that Hamilton's profit inflation thesis finds a good basis in the manipulation of the money supply, but draws incorrect conclusions when assuming that the gap between prices and wages is what caused entrepreneurs to grow wealthy and resulted in capitalism. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of the profit inflation um, thesis. You probably haven't. I'll go about it later. It's kind of interesting. And um, I'm going to just briefly go over how my paper is organized. I'll start out with the history, and then I'll summarize monetary theory. Um, I consider the debate about the price revolution. Um, and then I go into the specifics of the de debate. Um, the first specifics is between um, Malastroit and Bowdoin. There's a it's very um, historically contested debate. Um, I talk about the Malthusian population theory very briefly, and then I spent a lot of my analysis on Hamilton's profit inflation thesis and Keynes and the rebuttal of his profit inflation thesis. And then I go into the relevance to modern economics, which I'm not going to have time to do. Um, basically, I'll try to go through the history as quickly as possible. Um, preceded by the Renaissance, Catholic Church had usury bans, and mines were producing at a stable rate. And then um, these are the things that disrupted the money supply. One is technological advancements in the mining industry, a veritable financial revolution in the emergency field, um, the prolificacy of currency debasement by royals, the emergence of Protestantism as an alternative to capitalism, which um, resulted in the drop of usury bans which allowed interest to be charged on money um, and gave an incentive for um, fiat money and for um, them to have less money on reserve than the amount that they were um, getting have. And the last thing that I have to say about this is there are structural changes in the Mediterranean trade with Ottoman conquest which diverted more and more new silver flows away from the Levant to Northwest Europe in 1517. Um, Henry V is infamous for his great debasement program. A lot of other people did that. Um, timeline, um, price revolution started around 1470, lasted to 1650. Prices overall only really increased about 1%, but in different sectors it was different. And the reason that it's still relevant to study this is, well, first of all, because a lot of theorists have tied their theories based upon this. And second of all is because it lasted so long. It was unprecedented at this point. Okay. In my essay and in 
my um, outline, I go into a, a very brief summary of monetary theory, and I don't think I have time for that. I'll, I'll just, I'll do everything but business cycle theory, because I believe most of you guys are familiar with that anyway, and it's kind of complicated to describe in a short period of time. Um, Supply is the total stock of a commodity at any given time. The demand is the total market demand to gain and hold cash balances, build up of the marginal utility rankings of units of money, and value skills of individuals in the market. But the most important thing about this whole analysis that I give right here is the demand to hold aspect of money. Essentially, this is, this is what we see whenever we have inflation. Money's not worth as much as people think it is, so it's malinvestment, which results in lengthening and widening the capital structure, which results in entrepreneurial error and the cluster of entrepreneurial error, which essentially results in the waste of capital. That's the briefest description of business cycle theory I can. But what you guys need to get out of it is essentially money is being wasted and capital is being wasted. That's essential to my analysis, that because of inflation, Capital is being wasted because they're investing in processes which aren't necessary but appear to be necessary and go bankrupt. Okay. Before I actually go into that point, which is part of my analysis, I'm going to go into the historical debate between different um, theorists. The first person to actually comment on this is, is Pequeda. And after that, the Bowdoin Mastery debate is very famous. Um, after that, we have the Malthusian population theory and Hamilton. And there was a lot, there were hundreds of essays that were written in response to Earl Hamilton in, in analysis of that situation. Um, the Malthusian population theory, essentially what they say, it, what Malthus is saying in his population theory is that whenever you get a lot more people, then you have to um, start using land that's not as good to grow crops which makes the prices of food go up, which um, results in economic downturn. And really, I mean, there is a little bit of validity to that, but the first thing that he fails to realize is that technological advancements can take place and they will take place because when people are faced with a situation in which they're, they're not gonna make as much money, they have to find technological advancements so they can make money, and that's the beautiful thing about the division of labor, about the economy. And one thing, one thing that I said about this is that he misattributes cause and effect and doesn't account for um, technological advancements. Um, inflation reduces real income, so people would spend more money on inelastic goods such as food, which explains why the price of food is growing. If we have inflation, and people's real incomes go down, and they don't have as much money to spend on Xbox or whatever, so they're going to spend more of their money on food, so since the majority of money is being spent on food as opposed to these other items, the price of food is going to go up. Malastroy, Bowdoin debate, uh, I don't have time for that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, basically, only thing that's necessary for you guys to understand is that Bowdoin was the first person to express the quantity theory month. So that's why that's relevant. So here, now to the meat of my analysis, the interesting part. Um, his, Earl Hamilton's profit inflation thesis in Keynes. What Earl Hamilton claimed, which is very interesting, is that the sustained era of inflation from the early 16th century to mid 17th century was fundamentally the product of monetary factors and that this influenced capitalism and growth, which it makes sense why <coughs> Keynes would latch on to that, because Keynes all about, obviously, aggregate demand, what you do is you increase inflation, and then that causes people to invest more, which causes growth. But in my analysis, I show how this um, idea which influenced Keynes doesn't really make that much sense. So. Here we go. This is the profit inflation. The inflation we suffer from, despite the recession, which also is occurring, is caused by excessive profits far in surplus of the marginal worth of capital. 
Essentially, since there was a widening of the gap between prices and industrial wages, the profits of the entrepreneurs kept increasing, making expansion profitable. So he's saying that since the prices of goods are going up, prices of goods right here going up, and the price of labor is going up at a much lesser rate, the capitalists up here are increasing greater profits, which allows them to have technological advancements. But one oversight in that is capitalists are producing goods for people to purchase. If wages are really that low, and these people are really not receiving very much income, who's going to be buying the goods? Who's going to be purchasing these goods if everyone's in debt except the capitalists? It doesn't make sense. There's not going to be a demand because no one's going to be purchasing the goods. China. One, one thing that I do have to say, which is very, um, it's just saying about Hamilton, and there is the oversight that he made. I don't know if he realized that he made it, he probably didn't, but in his analysis, he says that Spain didn't have profit inflation, and that's why they didn't have capital growth. Obviously, if you look at Spain, it's easy to realize the reason that they didn't have growth is because they were having all this free money shipped into them from the new from America, from South America. So if they have all this free money, then they're not gonna make factories because they don't need to. They're just gonna spend it. And so they spend it everywhere else, which explains why there's more inflation over there and why they're not building factories in Spain. And so he really just, he really missed the mark there with his analysis. So this is, this is basically, if you're going to get anything out of this whole spiel that I'm trying to give right now, is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that inflation causes a loss of capital. So we have inflation, which results in entrepreneurial error, losses of capital. And so entrepreneurs have to find more efficient processes because the cost of factors of production is increasing. Because since we're wasting factors of production, and because of all these processes, then the entrepreneurs are going to go bankrupt unless they find a better way to do things, which is why they are um, engaging in technological advancements. Also, another thing is that this is actually essential to the analysis, is that inflation benefits debtors. Because if I borrow money, if I borrow money from Josh right now, and then money's not worth nearly as much a day later, whenever I pay it back to him, I'm benefiting greatly because obviously I, I made up. Like, and especially at this time when people didn't really understand inflation, they didn't really understand that it could happen and if they were loaning money then it wouldn't be worth as much in the future. It explains why the people, why the general population was impoverished while the capitalists prospered. Um, have a little thing that I was going to say about modern economics, but you guys can just think about that yourself. But I do have one quote that I want to give. This is from Ben Bernanke. I know you guys are all big fans of Ben Bernanke. Um, here's a quote that he says. The US government has a technology called the printing press that allows it to produce as many US dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. So that's it. I'm done. <laughs>